afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know me when I finish doing this, I'm Richard Thornton. I'm the um, Ch Chief Executive Officer of the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we're meeting. Um, I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the elders from other communities who may be um, with us here today. Um, I'd just also like to welcome you all to this um, Australian event, I guess, recognising the, the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is held each year on October the 13th. Um, the, day, the day provides for an opportunity for all of governments, local and state governments, NGOs, civil society groups, academics and science and business communities to demonstrate support for the implementation of the Sendai Framework for Action on Disaster Risk Reduction. It also provides an opportunity to highlight and discuss what's happening to achieve um, some of the objectives in that um, uh, framework. As the video showed, this year's focus is on raising the awareness of actions to reduce mortality around the world. Um, a recent report from um, the Centre for Research on Epidemiology of Disasters um, quotes a number of fairly startling um, comments around um, um, mortality. For example, the average recorded global mortality rate from 2005 to 14 was about 76,000 deaths per year. Um, in 2015 alone, it recorded uh, 22,773 deaths. Um, a lot of those, as we'll hear when we go through today's presentations, it came from um, events like floods and storms, earthquakes and tsunamis and wildfire. Um, we're here today to, I think I've just hit something, let me stop that. <laughs> we're here today to hear from a number of experts in the field to um, talk about what's happening nationally. Um, I'd just also like to thank um, a few organisations who have helped bring this together. In particular, I'd like to thank RMIT, who's hosting this event, and shortly I'll introduce John Hammer to say a few words. But I'd also like to thank the Attorney General's Department, uh, and particularly EMA, um, Geoscience Australia, Risk Frontiers, Emergency Management Victoria, and the Red Cross, um, all of which have kindly provided us speakers for today. Um, without any more ado, I'm going to quickly introduce Professor John Hammer uh, from RMIT, who's going to say a few words and uh, kick us off before we start on the main speeches. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Richard. I've got to have the mic pointing at you. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I'd just like to, uh, it was good Richard mentioned RMIT. It, uh, as you will see as you walk in, it looks like the CRC have taken it over. Um, just want to say it's a joint, it is a joint event. We're co-hosting it. So, uh, and we're very pleased that we have the opportunity to do that on uh, International Disaster Reduction Day. The um, the title of the seminar, Live to Tell, is actually the uh, UN designated title of the day. So, um, and as said, I'd just like to welcome you to RMIT and to the our university's disaster research network. Thanks. Um, the way we're going to run today is we'll run through the five present presentations. Um, each one will go for roughly 10 minutes. Um, we will, may have one clarifying question after each talk, but the intent of the, the day is we'll go through the, the five presentations and we'll get all the, all the presenters up here and uh, it'll be your chance to ask them difficult and probing questions um, and their challenge to answer them. Um, so I think we'll, we'll go through that process. Just so that you're aware, um, the proceedings today are being videotaped. Um, and that will be put and made available on the Bushfire Natural Hazards CRC website, but also um, on the UN's ISDR's uh, website as well. This is the third year we have undertaken um, this, um, never, never quite sure whether it's a commemoration or whatever, recognition of this International Day. Um, it is an important part of um, getting the message across about the framework 
um, for reducing um, disaster risk around the world. Um, as I mentioned, this, this day is really focused on uh, the mortality side of disasters. Um, and to kick us off um, with, um, I guess, a federal government view um, of, um, of, of where we're going is um, Mark Crossweller, AFSM, who is the Director General of Emergency Management Australia. Mark brings with him 32 years of operational experience ranging from being a firefighter through to Commissioner and now Director General, as well as 18 years in senior executive leadership and strategic management. In his role as Director General for EMA, Mark is responsible for, his co for the coordination of Australia's response to crises, including natural disasters and to terrorist or security related incidents, both domestically and internationally. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome Mark up onto the stage, who will start the presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, to RMIT and to the Bushfire Natural Hazards CRC, thanks very much for the invitation to present this afternoon. I've got about eight minutes to prosecute a one-hour argument, so um, I'm going to talk fast and you'll need to keep up with me as best as you can. Um, so the, the federal government is um, clearly committed to the Sendai framework. The Minister made, um, was the uh, Minister for Justice was the Australian government's representative in Sendai and gave commitments on behalf of the Australian government to participate in that uh, framework and uh, much of our governance at the federal level now aligns or will align with the intent of that framework. So I, I don't want to say too much more about that today because there's a couple of specific issues we probably need to talk about. But uh, but clearly Australia is, uh, is in the game. Um, are we prepared for catastrophic disasters? The notion of survivability um, needs to be taken or the concept or the philosophy needs to be taken to the extreme end if we're going to really appreciate the potentiality of disaster and how we reduce the loss of life in that context. So we um, propose, um, and this uh, thinking if you like is very much influencing and shaping the way the Commonwealth Government is approaching emergency management and its government's governance arrangements uh, more broadly. Um, so this is just a simple um, snapshot of some imagery from 2003 onwards. So um, it picks up the Canberra fires, the, the, uh, the Victorian fires, the Queensland floods, the Tasmanian bushfires, the, uh, the earthquake in New Zealand as examples. Um, and uh, these are never too far away from, uh, f from reality. So we often talk about the rarity of catastrophic disaster in Australia, but since 2003, those four disasters alone, albeit not as, not as uh, significant as they could otherwise be, were significant enough for the communities that had to experience them. Um, so we've had probably six or seven severe to catastrophic events in the last 10 years alone. Um, what I'll talk about briefly today uh, derives from these two papers, which were written uh, by ourselves about uh, two years ago. I'd just like to acknowledge Jim McLennan in the audience, who was, uh, and, and John Hammer as well, actually, who participated in a workshop at uh, the Australian Institute for Emergency, uh, for Emergency Management uh, in Mount Macedon a couple of years ago, which uh, helped to contribute to this thinking. So, um, understanding point of limitation is very important. One of the um, things we've realised in uh, natural disasters in Australia is that the industry had a perception or a I guess an attitude, uh, pervading attitude of being limitless in its capability. So uh, because we had done quite well and were doing increasingly well in our disasters up to probably arguably around 2003, always room for improvement, but, um, but we were probably developing a, a bit of an industry attitude, and I say that in the broadest possible context, that we were reasonably on top of things. Uh, and then of course we had the Canberra fires, the Victorian fires, the Queensland floods, and and uh, that, that started to, in, certainly in our mind, highlight um, some severe limitations in, in capability. So the point of this graph is to simply say, um, is to try and explain in simple terms what I call the point of limit, as, as well as a couple of other features. The first is, if you look on the left, there's a level of consequence, and it goes from low to high, or low to significant. If you go across to the right, it's uh, in terms of risk treatment effectiveness, it goes from highly effective to low effectiveness. And across the bottom is a simple scale that you could align to the fire danger rating system. And you can put any disaster in that context. And so if you look at the, the bar chart on the very left, low to moderate, um, and there's the, the, the brown uh, part of the chart is uh, uh, potential consequence, and then the red part is manifest consequence. So if you look at... Um, if you look at low to moderate events, our capability, which is the yellow part of the chart, is far superior to both potential and manifest consequence. And so we, we see very little, very little impact as a result of disasters at that scale. If I was to go back um, 100 years, you near know, the start of the 20th century, uh, we were probably struggling there, really, in, in this country in terms of how to deal with disasters and our, our rate of loss of life and property, damage to the environment and other things. 
was quite was quite profound, and it didn't take much of a disaster to see quite significant losses of life, relatively speaking. So we've certainly progressed. So you move through high to very high. We still do well. Consequence, uh, there's still some consequence. It's reasonably small. Our capability is reasonably good. Then you get to severe, the level of severe, and, and talking to commissioners and chiefs, first ministers, department representatives, and others over the last four years as uh, director general, two things come out of their conversations. One is we dodged a bullet. So they say it could have been worse. And the second thing they often say is we were stretched to our limit. Uh, so dodging a bullet and stretched to the limit um, worries us because that's not as bad as it could get. So if you stretch to the limit and you're dodging a bullet, then what else is there that potentially you need to deal with? So when you move to extreme to catastrophic, what happens is capability hits a limit and the event and its manifest consequence goes way past the capability way past it. And we saw that manifest in the Queensland floods, the Victorian bushfires as examples, and even the Canberra fires in 2003. So we say this, that most of our arrangements, and this was proved in a workshop that we ran in Melbourne uh, back in May, that most of our arrangements in Australia are predicated upon our experiences. And so they've grown up with us. So we tend to write arrangements and plans and legislation based on the last biggest disaster. Um, but, but, but our thinking is not infused with our imagination, it's only infused with our experience. So we say that one of the points of limit, uh, certainly in the human mind, is the limits of knowledge, skills, experience and imagination. So uh, something that profoundly came out from a comment uh, made by one of the uh, officers in charge of the Canberra fires, that that fire had gone beyond anything he'd learnt about, anything he'd experienced, anything he'd been through. Uh, but what really got him is it went through, uh, sorry, went past his, it went past his imagination. It exceeded anything that he could have possibly imagined. Um, and the irony with catastrophic disasters in any country is that they, they are rare enough to probably not have been experienced before, uh, yet they're still potentially manifest. They still have the potential to turn up on the landscape at a time not of our choosing. So we would say this, that somehow we've got to think differently about this problem. So wherever it's within our realm of experience that we need to keep getting better, and that's a reasonable proposition, otherwise we slip back. But where it's beyond our knowledge, skills, experience and imagination, that we need to think differently about that problem. Does that make sense? You're going to have to keep up with me here. We're racing through at a million miles an hour. Okay, so thinking differently, the first thing we would say is this, we need to accept inevitability. And natural disasters in Australia are inevitable, full stop. End of story. Uh, and you can, draw, you can draw a conclusion from that, that therefore so are catastrophic ones, albeit rarer in terms of their frequency. But to accept inevitability is in fact in a, in a, in a mental sense a space of non-resistance. It's a space of acceptance. So if we accept inevitability, we accept they will happen. Now, now our language to date has not been quite so clear. And our language has been pretty much in the space of risk management, likelihood and consequence. And as the slide says up there, that the irony with likelihood and consequence is this, that the most catastrophic uh, d disaster, the most consequential disaster, is usually the least likely. So what we've tended to do in the past is trade off. So we've said least likely means not needing to think too much about the problem. The difficulty is the most consequential implies the opposite. And here's the rub, that you don't get to choose it anyway. So, so if you trade off on likelihood or rarity is the basis of trading down on risk, which is a sensible risk management process to do. It's sensible to trade down in terms of economic and other investments based on rarity, because you can't afford to mitigate at the higher end, but you can't afford not to think about it either. And so our proposition is we need to think much more about it. So rarity might reduce risk, but it does not reduce consequence. And so it's very important we go in and have a look at that. So we've said this, that, and this is based on the US experience that I saw in Seattle and uh, and Anchorage in Alaska, where they have a huge earthquake problem in the Cascadia fault line down the west coast of America. And, um, and they accept the inevitability of a magnitude nine plus earthquakes in both those communities. So um, uh, Seattle, ha sorry, uh, Anchorage had a 9.2 earthquake in 1964 that rattled for five minutes, destroyed the city. Uh, 50 years later, you should see that city now. That was up there a couple of years ago. Um, they re ran that through uh, spatial simulation and uh, and the effects are profound, absolutely profound, but they accept at some point it will happen and they're working through how to solve those problems and what problems arise and how would you solve them. And they're orders of magnitude of complexity that we, we would simply not understand without going through that simulation process. If you go to Seattle, um, Seattle's even more complex. It has, it's, it's recorded, I think, 9.4 and 9.6, one of the strongest magnitude earthquakes ever to be recorded in 
the history of the planet. And, um, and when you apply that modelling to Seattle, you, you're talking about uh, deceased of many thousands, uh, injuries of many tens, if not hundreds of thousands, and thousands, and displacements of millions, inaccessibility. Uh, power issues, transport issues, communication issues, water issues, sanitation issues, like you would never possibly imagine. And they've been working on the problem for five years. And, uh, and they, they accept that by working on the problem now, they're closing the gap of surprise. So there'll still be plenty of surprises. You cannot possibly foresee all of the potential consequences in this space, but you can start working through the thematics. You can, can start working through those things that are going to cause the greatest level of grief. And, and being a former incident commander and uh, an incident controller and commissioner and everything else, I looked at the complexity of the problem and I realised that if I hadn't have thought about that on the day and that thing happened under my watch, I'd probably just resign on the day. It would be a, a less painful process than trying to go through it and then be sacked anyway because we didn't do well enough. So that's a bit of a joke, by the way. I would have stayed. <coughs> I would have stayed. But, but it really highlighted to me that we can't afford not to look into these spaces through the lens of imagination using good technology uh, and other things to really paint pictures of potential and to start to work through what those things might look like. And look, and just in closing, I think um, the thing I also um, came to discover through the experiences of 2003 moving forward was that there is an ethical premise here to disaster management and leadership. Um, and I've, I've often said this, and in fact I've said it so many times, I think my staff are getting sick of me saying it, but, but the greatest measure of success in disaster is the upholding of public trust and confidence. It's an ethical measure. Um, because we actually don't, we don't get to control the death rates. We don't get to control the damage rates. We can have some effect on them. We can have some effect on their reduction, but there's no control there. There's no control. So, so there is effect by mitigation. There's things we can do to reduce, but we're not in control of those numbers. We are much more in control of our ethos, the way we, we deal with disaster. So. How do, you, how do you turn uh, the ethical premise of trust into reality? Well, that's, that's another hour's lecture um, sometime uh, other than this afternoon. But I think it's probably the most important one and the greatest mission uh, in any disaster scenario is the reduction of human suffering, which, which in essence is the demonstration of compassion. So we would argue that trust is important, unity is critical. If you're not unified before a disaster, you better be unified during it because you won't be unified after it once you go through all the inquiries. Um, Disasters are a great teacher of humility. Uh, I think from 2003 through to 2011 particularly, taught the broader sector that we actually didn't know as much as we thought we did. They're great teachers of humility, but sometimes we've got to come back to first principles or really, really ground ourselves in the problems before we get too confident about how we think we're going to deal with them. Uh, and as I said, compassion, I think, is the, uh, is the greatest mission. It's the reduction of human suffering. And the thing that I've always said in leadership, and particularly in communities, is that we need to move them ultimately in time towards forgiveness, because it's the lack of forgiveness that causes the greatest mental distress uh, in communities where they perceive things should have been another way. Those things didn't turn out, manifest the way they thought they should. And somehow there's got to be a release. There's got to be an acceptance that things did not go as well as people had, had ex expected or planned and we, we need to move them to a better place. And certainly coming out of Canberra when I was commissioner, most people had worked through that disaster, a very small community that was quite traumatised. And I had some sympathy for those who were quite angry and frustrated, that, you know, the, the months and probably 12 to 18 months after the fire. But there were some people in that community when I was commissioner there 10 years later, still very bitter. And that was not healthy. It was not healthy at all because that, that, that society will always be vulnerable to catastrophic fire coming out of the Brindabella Range. So somehow there's got to be some sort of premise in this space to, to relieve people of the burden of a lack of forgiveness. So um, that's a very, very long conversation in 10 minutes. Is my time done? You're, 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 um, you're hanging around giving me the, the wink. Um, so I'd just like to open up today by saying that um, we are not immune from the catastrophic level disasters in this country. EMA spends a lot of time looking at potentiality. Even when disasters manifest, we'll look not only at what's manifesting, but the potential manifestation as well. And in closing, I'll give you a really simple example. Last summer in Tasmania, 1,200 lightning strikes in the western part of Tasmania, starting over 120 fires. Campaign went for 60 days. Uh, many of those fires undetectable and certainly uncontainable and inaccessible. Normally in that 60-day period, Tasmania would experience two, if not three, severe blow-up fire weather days. Had that have happened, you pro we probably would have lost half of Tasmania. Ironically, didn't happen. Weather stayed stable. 
but we knew that. We knew, while ever those fires were burning, of the potentiality for severe to catastrophic fire weather across the Tasmanian island. And we looked for it, we modelled it, it didn't manifest, luckily, but the potentiality was there. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that will have prompted um, many thoughts and questions for a little later on. <clears throat> um, with that, um, we'll move from a federal government view to, I guess, more of a uh, Victorian view um, with um, a presentation from John Schaubler, who's the Director for Emergency Management and Resilience um, at Emergency Management Victoria. Um, prior to that, um, John's been a, or well, probably still is, a volunteer firefighter. Uh, in the Dandenong Ranges, um, and also prior to that was a journalist. So, so thanks very much, Richard. Um, I, uh, I, I was heartened by some of the things that Mark was saying there because it, it, uh, it meant that we're sort of on the right track down here in Victoria, in some respects, so that's good. Um, I, I wanted to, to reflect on some of the developments in Victoria since 2009, and of course, um, you know, that was the uh, Black Saturday fires and, and, a, and a seminal event here in Victoria and in Australia in terms of loss of life in bushfire. Bushfire is the, the, the preeminent threat in Victoria, although as I stand here today, I, my phone is going off here talking about levee failures that are happening up on the Murray River at the moment, so and evacuations and all that sort of stuff, so, so we're not immune from other forms of disaster. I want to reflect on, uh, on that and and almost reverse engineer the questions that were posed at the start of the seminar around uh, fatalities and, and look at what we, and by we I mean government, ha has done since then. The, uh, the emphasis here in Victoria has shifted very much from managing risk uh, to managing consequence. This is in part driven by a view that risk is relatively well understood. So we, we have a good understanding of what the, the natural hazards and even the technologically and the politically driven hazards are, um, and by that I mean to include terrorism. So we, we recognise them, understand them, if we, even if we haven't ex experienced them. So the public policy directions in Victoria in that regard have shifted towards building resilient communities. And so we're now very much focused on communities themselves being resilient, less on the delivery of what we can do as as agencies and as government, and, fo and focusing in on the communities themselves and what they can do. So Emergency Management Victoria is in the final stages of developing a, a high-level risk resilience framework, uh, which will become a vehicle for aligning work that um, other agencies and other partners in the emergency sector will do. Um, it will set some basic principles that, um, in the context of emergency management, aim at supporting communities to be connected to be skilled in assessing, monitoring and managing their own risks, so, so looking after themselves, being able to identify problems and act on them, and being flexible and resourceful. There's, there's already some work going on, or some work that's been achieved already in Victoria around this, and, and uh, the Resilient Melbourne project led by the City of Melbourne is a, is a and as part of the Global 100 Resilient Cities program, uh, funded and led by the Rockefeller Foundation is one example of that. Uh, another is the recently released Victoria State Emergency Service Resilience Strategy. And so I would simply encourage you to go and look at those and, and uh, consider them as indicators of the direction that we're heading in as a sector. Having said that, uh, in setting policy, government's not immune from inadvertently creating some perverse outcomes. Uh, the, the 2009 fires, as I said, were a tragic and pivotal point in Victoria's history. And uh, I reflected in the media at the time that the immediate aftermath of significant disasters is the worst possible time to develop public policy. Uh, and of course, this is precisely the point at which, in the political cycle, at which public policy is often made. Um, often the drivers are quintessentially political. Um, Mark, I'm sure, is well aware of that. It's much easier for a political leader to stand there and say, you know, to stand in the ashes of a town that's just been destroyed and say, we will rebuild, rather than to stand there and say, we'll just stop and think about this for a minute. So the political pressures are quite uh, intense. The key themes that, that emerged from 2009 in a policy sense were a shift in the advice given to those likely to be affected by bushfire, a broad scale extension of the means of providing warnings and advice, and a change in the provision of public shelter during bushfire emergencies. So they're the three things that, that the three large policy shifts that emerged from that. 
Uh, there is a range of other stuff that emerge in terms of management of emergencies, of structures within government, the way in which we uh, organise uh, response and recovery. Those things are, are evolving, and I have to say are revolving reasonably successfully. So Victoria has become a bit of a model in that space of how you actually organise your arrangements. But much was made that at the time of the failure of the so-called the so stay or go policy. Uh, primacy of life emerged as the principal policy driver in the aftermath of the fires, which is interesting because I'm quite sure that no one in government, or certainly in the fire agencies and certainly no firefighters, ever doubted that primacy of life was the, the key uh, objective. I'm, um, uh, or that any, you know, that at any po point had suggested that it wasn't. Um, what was suggested was the prevailing, st the so-called stay or go policy uh, placed too high a premium on the idea that property ranked somehow equally with, with the preservation of life. Now, from a risk management perspective, the only sound advice that anyone can give in relation to bushfire or flood or any range of other hazards is, is uh, if you're not in its path, you won't be killed by it. Nothing's changed in that equation. Uh, if you're not there, you won't, you won't die. So the policy shift was, was one of emphasis, and it emphasised the idea of leaving early. So the message clearly became leave early. The, the, the defence of property became a secondary uh, message. The next shift was in the means and the specific, specificity of the advice provided. So the artefacts of this are things like um, the development of smartphone apps, uh, the, national, the, the emergency alert, the national emergency telephone warning system, uh, the, and in Victoria the reinstatement of sirens for warnings and a host of other mechanisms. Um, for advising people of danger and calling them to action. Uh, the third shift was in the, in the provision of last resort shelter options, uh, both public and private in the form of fire refuges, the unfortunately named neighbourhood safer places, and regulated private shelters otherwise known as bunkers. So how has it worked? Um, well, it worked spectacularly well at Wye River uh, on Christmas Day last year in terms of, of, of preventing fatalities. Um, there was a clear message, there was a community that was primed for action, and they took action. Uh, no one died, 450 odd people evacuated the town successfully, but more than 100 houses were destroyed. Uh, most of them secondary holiday residences, but destroyed nonetheless. So what, what are the significant perverse outcomes here? Well, you can tell everyone to leave, but they need to go somewhere. Uh, and it's not always clear where that might be, so we've been less successful actually telling people where to go. Um, when everyone leaves, it stands to reason that the property loss from undefended properties will be relatively high, and that will have a range of longer term social and economic consequences uh, and other impacts on those communities. And that is now playing out at Wye River in that community, um, uh, which, is, which is quite, you know, there's a lot of anger there. Um, there are a lot of people who said we could have done things better, you know, but, but at the bottom line is that on the day no one died uh, and, the, and the, 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 uh, the key objectives were attained. So there's a bit of a trade-off there. Um, in, terms of in, in terms of advice, the thinking is that the more people know about an event uh, and the better warned they are, the better prepared they will be to take action. The flip side of that, and we've, we've seen some, we've, there's been some uh, research that demonstrates is, is that it is a deferral of action, so people actually wait and see. Um, it promotes a growing dependence on waiting to be told what to do uh, rather than actively seeking information. People wait for a text message now, they wait for the telephone to ring, they wait for some advice before they actually take action. And the third shift is probably the most perverse, and that's at a time, at the same time as we're encouraging people to leave early, we're building infrastructure and defining safe areas that give them the default op option of actually staying. So um, waiting and seeing what happens. And we know from research that, that we did shortly, shortly after Black Saturday that, that what should be the last resort option in effect becomes the first for about 20% of the population. So they sh they've shifted their thinking saying, well, rather than leaving, we're gonna stay because we have this default safety position. So are we building community uh, resilience? And the honest, honest answer to this has to be yes and no. Um, at its most perverse, public policy runs the risk of building greater dependence rather than resilience, and that's something to be guarded against. 
Okay, thank you, John. Um, the next speaker in our list is um, Dr. Um, I've lost, I've lost a place in my thing. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Catherine Haynes. Um, Catherine's been working in um, the field of um, trying to understand um, what leads to fatalities in, in disasters, particularly in, in the early days when she was working with the bushfire CRC looking at the actions and, um, and conditions that led to um, loss in bushfire. More recently, Kat's been doing work in the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC together with her host organisation, uh, Risk Frontiers, um, looking at broader issues around fatalities, in particular in flood, which has led to changes, I guess, particularly in the way that New South Wales has been trying to talk about the warnings around flood risk. Uh, I'd like to introduce Kat to the stage. So I'll be talking about um, some ongoing work that we're doing um, with the Bushfire Natural Hazards CRC around human fatalities from natural hazards. And I'm going to focus today on floods. Given what's happened over the last six months, I think that's um, very pertinent. And it's also one of the most recent bits of work that we've done. So our objective with this work is really to analyze the social and environmental circumstances surrounding the deaths from the range of natural hazards that we face here in Australia. We're looking at a longitudinal and geographical examination of trends in exposure and vulnerability. And it's essentially to provide an evidence base for appropriate emergency management resourcing and decision making. Quickly touch on the methods. So at Risk Frontiers, we've held a data set called Paralors, where we've been inputting information around fatalities and injuries and building losses and natural hazard events. And many of the deceased in that data set, we have the names. So that's then enabled us to go to coronial archive offices to pick up the reports and the witness statements and a real wealth of information around each of those fatalities. So from all of that work, here's a table showing Australia's top five natural hazard killers. Extreme heat, heat waves overwhelmingly the biggest killer, followed by floods, cyclones, bushfires and storms. And the story here is essentially one of good news. We see decreasing death rates for the top four hazards listed here. For wind, we've just finished this piece of work and what we see in the data set, it's not statistically significant, but we do see a slight increasing trend of people dying from gust events. And we actually had a fatality here in Melbourne on Sunday from, from some gusts. So I think this is really one to watch going forward. What we also see in the trends in these deaths is sort of towards the beginning of the last century, really high numbers of men. And then in more recent times, we're seeing increasing proportions of female fatalities. On also, for all of these hazards apart from flood, we're seeing relatively large numbers of people dying in fairly large events. Whereas for flood, we're seeing sort of one and two people dying in fairly sort of small to moderate events. So we'll look at that in more detail now. So this graph shows gender and death rates over time for floods. And I think one of the most significant things here, um, apart from it's 80% men in this data set, also you can see from about the, 19, about the 1960s, we see a really dramatic decrease in the death rates. And that's hugely statistically significant. So that's, you know, increase in science, the ability to provide warnings and technology, professionalization of emergency management, land planning, building codes, a huge number of things. You know, suddenly everyone had radios. And particularly in that period post-war, I think there were a lot of things that really have led to that decrease in the death rates. But then what we see from 1960 is, although the death rate is still decreasing, it's not statistically significant, and it's almost negligible. So that, I think, raises questions then about what we're currently doing in terms of risk management, risk reduction, education, and is it as effective as we hope it is? Also, what we see here from the 1960s is a sort of fairly dramatic and significant increase in the proportion of female fatalities associated with those men. So there's still more men dying in floods, but from the 1960s, we're also seeing more women. And, that, and we see that with all of those natural hazards that I listed before. Um, so it's, it's, it's really around men and women from the 1960s living more similar lifestyles, working in similar jobs, traveling around in similar ways. This shows age and gender. And for the whole data set, so when we look at sort of the first 60 years and more recent time, we're seeing a very similar trend in terms of age. So the high-risk groups are those under the age of 29, again, very much men, 
It's only when we look at the data over the last 15 years that we're beginning to see a slightly creeping up proportion of men in their 50s and 60s who are also dying. So when we look at by state and territory, overwhelmingly the majority of the fatalities are in Queensland and New South Wales, and that again holds for the whole data set. So they account for almost three quarters of all the deaths in that data set. And then it's only when we look at the states by population that we begin to see also a heightened vulnerability in the Northern Territory. And that's the only state when you look at the deaths through time where we're seeing a slight increasing trend of fatalities. When we look by season as well, we see that the majority of the deaths in New South Wales and Queensland, the Northern Territory, they're all happening between December and March. And also in New South Wales, we see a high proportion occurred coinciding with those East Coast lows, the winter storms around June and July. For the other states, it's, it's evenly distributed throughout the year. So when we look at activity and capacity, we see that the highest proportions of men and women are dying while they're attempting to cross a bridge or a flooded road. And where the information is available, we can see that most of those people are trying to make their way home. Second highest cause of death for women is where they're unaware of the flood. They're carrying about their everyday business and they're suddenly impacted by flash flooding. For men, the second highest activity is being engaged in some kind of action in the water. And for most of those people, they're recreating. So when we looked at their capacity and their ability to make decisions, we found that for most people, they were aware of the flood, they were capable of independent action, but the speed and depth took them by surprise. But we also see another group there, which is people who were following the decision-making of others. So that's people who are passengers in a car and children who are following the decision-making of parents. So when we look at transport, we see, as you would expect, since the 1960s, um, a, a very large proportion of people dying associated with cars, massive increase in people in four-wheel drives over the last 15 years. We see that the majority of the drivers are men. When we look at the passengers, the highest proportion are actually females. We also see a large proportion of fatalities among children and youth who are also associated with vehicles and being passengers. And something that I've found very interesting in this data set is when we're looking at people in vehicles, we're seeing that most of them are dying at night or during twilight when visibility is very poor. So I wonder if people even realize the danger that they're getting into or even aware that the road ahead of them is actually flooded. So I think some points that are coming from this research that I you know I would like to research further and I think we can discuss today with all the work that we're putting into this area, should we see a greater decrease in those death rates from 1960 on? Are we effectively targeting those high-risk groups? So, you know, we see this is very much men, young men, but we're also seeing that women are engaged in quite different activities and for different reasons to men. And I think with bushfires as well, this is also very clear. We see very different actions to what men and women are taking. And here with floods too, we see a lot of children in recent times who are recreating in flood water. And you know, even over the last few weeks, we've all seen images on the news and YouTube of people rafting on inflatable mattresses down swollen rivers and kayaking and all sorts of things. So is the message getting through? We also see large numbers of people dying at night. So then if it, the fact is that they actually can't see and they don't know the dangers they're taking, does the risk communication work anyway? And we, should we be investing in better roads and mitigation to actually make those roads safer? And then lastly, are we effectively evaluating our risk reduction strategies? So are we really investing in rigorous evaluations of the communication material? Are we looking at those structural changes and comparing them against each other? Where is it best to spend our money? You know, perhaps it's with laws and greater enforcement of those laws. But are we, are we really looking and researching this? Thank you. Um, it's also worth noting that the CRC today put out a um, hazard note, which is its four-page summary, um, covering a lot of the work that CAT's done in flood risk. Um, so if you don't get that, please go to our website, on the bottom there, um, and sign up for our newsletters and hazard notes. Um, our next speaker um, is, I'll just get the right slide up. Moment. is Dr. Martin Wolf. Um, Martin has been um, uh, working in, in at Geoscience Australia now for five, six, five years, five years. 
Um, Martin's got a varied history coming, uh, originally coming from Holland, so knows a lot about floods. <laughs> um, but um, has worked um, in Geoscience Australia, um, trying to coordinate a lot of the coastal work in the CRC. Um, but also, um, more broader than that, was instrumental in pulling together the work of the CRC's research program in the early days. Uh, we couldn't have done it without Martin. Um, and Martin's going to give us a view of some of the work that geoscience is doing, particularly around um, issues to do with mitigation, I believe. Okay, good afternoon. Um, just to time myself, there we go. Uh, thanks for um, giving me the opportunity to tell uh, a slightly different version uh, of the same story, a slightly different angle, and hopefully they'll paint a picture between us. Um, my name is Martin Wolf. I work for Geoscience Australia. It's a government institute and among many other things we look at community safety by trying to understand the impacts of natural disasters, mostly in Australia but also overseas. And from this perspective, I would like to talk to you about um, a disaster type that hasn't been talked about much today yet and that's earthquake. But it's going to be, what I'm saying is going to be applicable to other disasters as well. Now, this is an image from the recent event in August in central Italy, uh, but really the image is horrendously familiar from many other earthquakes in, in recent past, um, closer to home, of course, in New Zealand, uh, but also in Nepal and, of course, in, in Newcastle. And that is people picking over rubble trying to find survivors. And that's a horrendous image, and it really brings home um, the way that we see a lot of casualties and mortality occur during those events. And in the face of this particular picture, it seems very callous to say earthquakes don't kill people, because very obviously they do. But really the statement that has been mentioned often, I think is worth repeating here as well, is um, earthquakes don't kill people, but buildings do. It's not always true, but in very many cases, and certainly in this particular event in Italy, most of the several hundreds of casualties and, and several far, I think, thousands of injuries were sustained by people who were um, injured and killed by the collapse of buildings. And that really highlights how a lot of disasters impact on people and, and cause those causalities if they don't drown in a flood. It is uh, when you get together the physics of the actual hazard, in this case that would be the shaking, but then the fact that there are people in harm's way and there are collapsing structures around them. And I want to show you another example of an earthquake that was almost as strong and you probably haven't heard about, and that's this one. It happened this year in Australia, almost the same magnitude as the one in Italy. Um, what the line that you see in the landscape is the fault scarp, 20 kilometers long, um, in the Peterman Ranges. How many people did it kill? None. I don't even know what the damage is. I don't think it was very extensive because pretty much nobody is there. So earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do. And understanding how these elements of that impact story come together gives us clues around um, building resilience and reducing injuries and fatalities from disasters. And some of the work we do at Geoscience Australia and many other institutes that are connected to the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC will try and put together the elements of that puzzle to try and figure out how we can build more resilient communities, not necessarily only on experience, but looking forward, trying to imagine the unimaginable, as Mark Crosswell has said earlier, trying to figure out what we can do for those events that we, we can't really imagine, but actually we can often model them. So I'm going to give you an example from a scenario that hasn't quite happened yet, but is very imaginable, and we should be imagining this one. This is an earthquake, much smaller than the ones that I've just shown you, uh, of a type that happens just about every year somewhere in Australia, but now we're actually looking at the scenario where that event happens under Greater Sydney, in an area where the shaking will affect about 4 million people and 1.1 million homes. This is really not a very extreme event, and uh, it, it's very something we should be expecting sooner or later. Now, in terms of it actually happening under Sydney, the return period is 500 years. That seems a long return period. From uh, managing hazards, it's not. And in fact, it's also not from an engineering standard because it is within the building code. So uh, a house should be built, modern house should be built to withstand this kind of shaking. And of course, if you're looking at hospitals or schools, they should be even stronger. However, of course, not all our houses are modern and certainly not in an area like this. So if we model the physics of this event and what it would look like, 
What might we imagine would happen in Greater Sydney if this were to happen tonight? The colours here indicate the severity of damage, and uh, it's in residential houses alone. Um, I don't want to go into um, the particular spread of these colours in any way, they're not very visible because most of them are exactly under that bullseye. Um, but really what I want to draw your attention to is that the damage is incredibly widespread. There's thousands and thousands of houses that are damaged to some extent, some very severe, will be collapsing. There's billions of dollars in damage to residential houses alone. Um, but the, the real startling figure is at the bottom, I think, of those little icons. And that's almost a thousand people will be injured at some level, and about 10 of those will be severely injured and die. That's a startling point because we should be expecting this event. The other way we should think about this event is as widespread, widespread chaos. Electricity will fail, will be off for several days. There'll be rubble everywhere. There'll be a uh, bit electricity failure and a lot of damage to infrastructure will be things like wastewater plants where that won't work, so there will be water spillage everywhere. It'll be, it'll be chaotic, even though it's actually a very minor event. And from an insurance perspective, this is not something they're very worried about, but the question is, as a society, should we be? Now, the modeling that we've been doing at GA, and partly as uh, part of the, our work with the natural, Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC with the University of Adelaide, is about saying, well, what can we do to try and prevent some of these impacts from happening, and specifically that number at the bottom there of all those people getting injured and dying. Well, we can investigate with our models what causes those deaths, and again, it's, it's many of those collapsing houses, and specifically the older ones, the older brick houses that are so prevalent in this area. What if we improved the strength of those houses? We won't raise them to the ground and rebuild them, that's, that's unrealistic, but we can actually make structural improvements to those. And if we model what that does to the same event, then the scenario looks very different. The damage goes down a lot. Far fewer houses are damaged and the, and the actual loss number goes down. But really where the biggest gains are, from my perspective, is that the number of injuries and casualties goes down from almost 1,000 to 377. And very significantly, if you break that down, then you see the blue bars here representing the scenario as it would be tonight, and the red ones, the scenario if we had improved those older homes in terms of strength. And you can see there are no longer severe injuries and deaths. So there are things we can do about our ability to survive an event like this, even if it's one that we don't tend to think about a lot because we don't tend to think about earthquake all that often. So I think the key points that I would like to interject in this conversation today is that we can actually use science, such as is happening in the Net Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC and many other institutes, to help us understand impact and risk from natural disasters. And we can understand elements of the puzzle that we can improve, that we can actually very much control to improve the outcome in terms of injuries and fatalities. In this case, and in many other hazards, older housing and infrastructure, legacy, uh, as we call it, exposure, legacy assets that we all live in every day, are vulnerable to hazards in a way that we try to forget because we think about modern building codes, but of course that is not applicable to, to the structures that you see around you. There are options to actually improve those and they will make our community safer. And that in the long run will allow many more of us to live to tell the tale. I have to say I thought today a theme for today's uh, thing sounded more like a Bond movie and I've been looking out for um, um, James Bond, but not yet. But anyway, I think in terms of saving the day, then uh, a lot of this work can actually help improve the outcomes for all of us in the long run. So thank you. So any of you thinking of going to Sydney tonight, probably better to stay at home. Um, our next speaker um, it comes from the Red Cross. Let me just put this one up. Um, and is John Richardson, who's the National Coordinator for Preparedness for the Red Cross. Until 2007, he was the State Recovery Management Manager in the Department of Human Services in Victoria. His extensive practice and policy experience at individual, local, state, um, national and international levels. Did you get anywhere in that one? <laughs> um, as a registered nurse, uh, he's worked in a range of areas, including cancer nursing and emergency nursing. He's also helped to co-facilitate bereavement support groups following Black Saturday and has experience in bereavement and trauma both 
post Bali bombings and in Black Saturday. Um, I'll let John say more about what he's going to talk about, but welcome, John. Thanks, thanks Richard. Um, you know, the last couple of bits will probably give you an idea of potentially what I'm going to uh, sort of cover off. So um, we heard a lot uh, before about numbers and, and policy and that sort of stuff. My plan is to talk about the human dimension because that's sort of where I come from. Uh, so what we've heard before, hopefully making uh, this uh, um, why is this all important? Uh, I will sort of uh, say uh, there's a parental advisory, a strong adult themes uh, and coarse language, no nudity, which is uh, you'll be pleased about. Um, but yeah, look, there, there's, there's some, um, these are personal reflections and accounts of the work, work that I've done in the last so 25 years. I've been privileged having been with many people who've taken their last breath as a, as a nurse uh, in a whole range of, of different scenarios. Uh, and so, you know, you, as a nurse, you, you really do um, have quite a special sort of bond uh, with, with people as they, you know, as they pass from, I guess, this, this, this place to the next. So it's something that uh, I've experienced, I've never shied away from it, equally I don't, don't seek it out. But in working with, as a recovery manager, um, my interaction with death is actually quite different and this is with the survivors, so you know, those people who have cheated death or uh, those people left behind to deal with uh, the aftermath, the loss, the holes, the, the gaps, the pain, the anger, the tears, the dark humour and the frustration, these are all things that people, people talk about. Death is a really uh, increasingly foreign concept for us in, in modern society. We kind of expect to die in our sleep, surrounded by our grandchildren. It's not the experience that our parents or, or grandchildren had, uh, our grandparents had, who lost mothers and sisters in childbirth, uh, sons and daughters to childhood illnesses, um, brothers to industrial accidents, fathers to road accidents, and of course, fathers, sons, brothers, uncles to war. These. Um, you know, you compare the front page of the age from 1914 to 2014 and think about, about how the war was reported. Uh, deaths were possibly a little list somewhere down the bottom of the age, whereas a death in Afghanistan now is, is a front page story. Um, because it's in our technological age, you know, we've kind of drastically reduced risk. Uh, we expect someone else to fix it. Uh, and that's partly because we become, we've become really good at fixing things and, uh, and, and then, of course, trumpeting how we, we fix things, which um, I think is also part of the problem. Um, so when de death happens now, it's actually uh, unusual. It's a surprise. And, uh, and so our societal reactions are quite overt, all-consuming. Think about the aftermath of Bali. Think about the aftermath of Black Saturday. Think about the aftermath of Canberra, as, as Mark spoke about earlier. We tend to characterise deaths um, by de uh, disasters by death tolls, um, cricket scores, as my colleague, former colleague Tom Banforth um, spoke about. Um, they cost much more than that, but this is what people focus on, and you know that's I think that's one of, one of, one of the challenges. Is that I remember an exercise I was involved with, as the exercise manager kept dialing up the numbers, you know, and. Uh, you know, it was like a 747 laden with anthrax crashing into a public housing building. So there's a catastrophe for you, Mark. Um, I made the comment to the group, let's not forget that these numbers uh, are not just that. They're mothers, daughters, brothers, uncles, colleagues, friends, classmates, teammates, neighbours, and there's a story behind each of them. Most people at that stage looked at me blankly. I mean, I hope that we've changed and we've come a long way since then. Deaths and disasters are, are violent, disturbing, and occur in desperate, horrifying circumstances. Sometimes the way people d die suggests pain, terror, and loneliness. Thinking of this makes us come to terms with the fact that death itself is far more difficult and complex. Often the people think, swing between grief and, and horror. Our society has a fairly simplistic view of disasters, losers and winners. You know, the winners survive, the losers die, and it's not that simple. Uh, those of us whose lives are inextricably linked to disasters. You know, we operate in the kind of shades of grey, uh, not, not 50, thank God. Um, but the nuance, the, you know, that stuff that those who have been left behind have to deal with the aftermath, 
uh, as to those who have survived. Um, the Ban Air, uh, a, a great disaster manager and sociologist and Hillsborough survivor, said uh, to me once, uh, it's, it, we form this kind of hierarchy of, of, of grief uh, and ultimately you know, the, the importance that's paid on the highest sacrifice. But no two experiences the same and all are valid. And I sort of observed this in my work, particularly after Bali, where you had counter accusation and counter accusation. You didn't lose anyone, but you weren't there. Stories of survival are celebrated, held up and, and fated, as they should be, but they also come at a, at a cost, um, and that's not a reality TV show. Um, in the quietest moments, when these events kind of relive themselves, you thought you were going to die, and you, in fact, in one way, did, as the trauma um, specialist would tell us. Thinking you're going to die is a significant predictor of post-traumatic stress, but people will tell you that you're lucky. You know, someone was looking after it. At least you survived. Think about those who didn't. And then, so then your experience is actually diminished, and you feel you have no rights in, the, in this in, in instance. Control's taken away from you. You can't put your ha hand on someone's brow who, who's, who's died. You can't visit the, the site at which they had fell until you're allowed to. You may never be able to bury them. And this leaves you in a com uncomfortable gnawing what if. You may have no rights, as your former husband who doesn't talk to you does not pass on any information. You may receive information, but you just don't understand it. Uh, the bushfire brain or cyclone brain or flood brain, whatever it is, has, has set in and a heady mix of adrenaline and cortisol cloud everything that you do. You have no idea what they wanted. You may, have, you may even find out that they had a whole other family that you didn't, never knew about, and this has happened. You may ask yourself, how did this happen? After the disaster, your grief is not your own. You mourn in the full view of the public, including the mourners in chief. The inquisition, the intrusion that holds your grief in place is, is not usual. We don't experience that, that normally. Then all of a sudden, the football crisis, political crisis, or a cat video will whisk it all away from the public eye, but you're left then there to sort of deal with it. And then people will start to say, aren't you over this yet? I worked with a group of um, bereaved survivors from Black Saturday to produce a book called Surviving Traumatic Grief. If you're ever involved in, in a disaster, I suggest you get hold of this. It's a very important resource. The 21 contributors reflected on their own experience and wanted to share it to help others because of what they went through. They felt that having something to read or having somebody close to them be able to read it would have made a huge difference. It was, a, I have to say, it's one of the most rewarding and sort of powerful processes I've been through. To think about what is at stake and what we kind of heard here today, we've got to think beyond the cricket scores um, of deaths, homes lost, grants paid. These social costs are human stories in households and streets and neighbourhoods and towns. These stories are a mother saying goodbye to their sons, hearing windows break and the flames engulf them. Of a man inside his house ringed by fire thinking this is it, only for it to go quiet and the fire disappears. Weeks later at a community event, trying to make a sense of what happens with others, he's overheard by an air crane pilot. Ah, that was your house. Of a son separated from his parents and makes it safe, safely to the football ground, his parents take another route, sheltering in a building that provides them with no shelter. And they're found in, the, in a bathroom, their hands entwined. Of a couple who said, I thought we were prepared until we saw the fire front. I'm never doing that again. It's too fucking scary. Of a mother and son pushed by rampaging seawater towards the ceiling of the villa in Phuket, saying a silent farewell as the last centimetre of air approaches only for the water to recede. And of a seven months pregnant woman struggling through smoke and heat, falling just a short kick from a football oval and certain safety. You stand on this spot, marked by a little bit of blue tape, after the firestorm, and you really question absolutely everything. So these are many stories. It sounds melodramatic. I'm sorry if it was. Um, but these are the stories that should be getting us out of bed, because that's what really um, what we're on about here today, to make a dif difference so everyone can enable, enable everyone to live to turn, tell the tale. Thank you.
Um, open it up for questions. There's one in the middle here. Thank you, uh, and thank you very much to all the speakers. It's really interesting talks. Uh, Can you hear it here? No, <laughs> you might need to speak up. I'm worried I'm going to get really loud. Is it this good? It's mainly because I think the, the garbles is up here and the speakers. <laughs> speak up a little bit. So. All right, I'll speak up. Uh, I think this uh, question is directed to the Director General for the Emergency Management Australia. Uh, the Sendai framework has several key priorities, two being um, strengthening disaster risk governance. And I'm wondering what type of progress is being made to reviewing the disaster management legislation, although I know it's in by state uh, in Australia. The Red Cross works a lot with helping other countries strengthen their disaster risk management frameworks. Uh, with great support from, from DFAT, and I'm just wondering if we're applying the same rigor at home? It, it, it's actually very difficult to hear up here, but I think I've got the essence of your question. Are we applying the same rigor that the Sendai framework applies to our risk management in Australia, is that right? The legal framework. Uh, good question. Um, I, the short answer is I actually don't know the specifics. Um, I, I would say though that Australia has a very mature risk framework. Um, the um, the ANZ EMC, the Australian New Zealand Emergency Management Committee, some years ago moved on a um, national approach to a, a emergency risk assessment, um, which most states have committed to. In fact, all states have committed to. Um, I think the last state to move through that process. Uh, is probably Queensland. The rest of, uh, have already moved through it. Um, so we have a reasonable picture of risk in Australia. We have a reasonable level of consistency. We have an Australian standard that underpins our risk assessments. Um, there's clearly more to be done. Um, EMA identified, uh, in fact, at the last ANZMC meeting, we had approval to do a national statement of natural disaster risk for this country. Um, that's not a small piece of work. It's quite, quite a complex approach, quite a complex uh, commitment, but it's necessary to do it nonetheless. So we have many of the co component parts of a risk assessment for this country, but we don't have a total picture. We don't have a, a fuller understanding. So um, so in terms of legal basis, um, a bit hard to comment specifically, I think. It's it's a mature framework in this country. It, it, it is considered in most things that people do in a legal context. They'll look at legal, political, social, technical, environmental risks that are associated with policy, associated with legislation. Um, so I'd say it probably is well embedded in our frameworks, but in the context of what Sendai specifically requires, I, I probably couldn't answer that to be truthful. I couldn't give you a straight up answer. But I'm happy to follow up for you. If you want to catch me after this, the session, I'll, I'll chase it up for you. John, did you want to make a comment on that? John Hammond? Me. Yeah. Uh, I, think, uh, I, I think I heard something about risk governance as well for Australia. and. Uh, and I was, I was just thinking that, uh, and you seem to be referring, of course, again, the, it, was, it might seem strange, we couldn't hear what you're saying. So you just speak, speak a bit louder if next time people uh, shout at us. Uh, you were talking about the, the, the legal front, the actual legal this legislation and so on as well. And, and uh, my thought was, uh, following from what Mark was saying, that uh, the government in Australia spends a lot of effort on these things. But uh, that's just part of the picture. And if we look at the whole uh, governance of, um, say, disasters, especially ones with natural triggers, uh, I, I would argue that uh, there's a lot, lot of space outside government for a, a lot more work. And I think that's where we're probably, that's probably where we're weakest, even though the business round table and, all, and, and lots, of, lots of certain elements of society in Australia are very active, I think it's really patchy outside government. So I'd say that's where, for, in terms of governance, there's a lot of room for, for improvement and yeah, especially in terms of what Sendai is asking. We might just get all the panel to move the chairs forwards without going over the edge. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with how close you are, it's where you are relative to the loudspeakers, I think. <laughs> this is the way we increase vulnerability, is by pushing the panel closer to the edge of the stage. Um, any other questions? One over here. 
Uh, Leonard Rifles, Melbourne Uni. I've got a related question expanding on the previous uh, person in relation to a sender implementation. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm in the middle of a project that looks at the implementation of Senda in Europe, um, and I was interested in maybe John and Mark's perspective on the compatibility of the philosophy of risk reduction with the resilience paradigm that seems to be sort of endemic within Victoria, by the sounds of it in particular, but also broader, more broadly in Australia. For Victoria, it sounded like there was almost, uh, we've sort of been caught, we've done disaster risk reduction, we're moving towards resilience. What does Senda mean? conceptually in terms of the, the compatibility of those paradigms, if you like, for the resilience orientation in Australia. If, if you, I'd be very curious in your perspectives on that, if you have some to share. If you understood what I said, so I can't hear my... Sorry, could, could you repeat that with the microphone in your mouth? In my mouth, Just yeah. in one sentence, we really... I'm sorry, you've got to hold the microphone. That's right. Essentially, I'm interested in the compatibility of the disaster risk reduction paradigm with the orientation in Australia and Victoria towards building resilience and um, how you so see that impacting potentially in the future. Yeah, look, I don't think they're inconsistent at all. I think um, uh, risk, look, the, the, the thing with risk reduction, which is very important and Ascendi focuses on risk reduction and, and we should always be in that space, but we can't get to risk negation. And I think that's the difficulty. And, and, and if I was to reflect briefly on the national security world, that if you look at Australia's posturing in national security, safety is predicated on the negation of threat. So much of our public policy is trying to actually negate threat as the basis of safety. Um, risk reduction almost implies the same sort of thing. If we keep reducing risk, we'll, we'll be safer and we'll, we'll ultimately negate the threat. Well, that's not actually how the world works and how life works. So risk reduction is important but there is still ultimately a manifest consequence. There is still something that happens when a disaster happens. Now, hopefully less happens, but something still happens. So risk reduction is important, but all risk treatments have limitations. And that's what I was, the point I was trying to make in my speech, that and um, as long as we know what that limitation is, um, we can do something about it when the disaster manifests. But if we think that by risk reduction, we've so completely solved the problem, and we haven't tested the, the limits of that risk treatment, that's where we get surprised. So the stay and go policy in 2009 came out of the Ash Wednesday fires in the early 80s because it seemed very sensible that we were losing a lot of property and we lost lives and property as a result of poorly prepared properties. And so we learned a lot about that. So we developed the policy about, you know, roughly speaking, stay and go. But it had a limit. And 2009 showed the limit. In fact, it more than showed the limit. It, it exceeded it quite extensively. So. Risk reduction is important, and, and we're all obliged to participate in that space. What we're saying is it's part, so Sendai is very important, risk reduction is very important, but we're saying there are other factors as well that need to be considered. So all treatments have limitation, and these disasters go past them. They manifest consequences that go past the capacity to mitigate. And that's what I'm saying about the, the, the changing the way we think about risk. That, that minimising risk or reducing risk is a good thing, but it's, it, it doesn't necessarily result in zero death and no impact. And often people think that it does, that they'll be safe. Not necessarily the case. It's, it's, do you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's very important, but um, risk treatment alone is, is not enough. You have to accept the inevitability of a disastrous event wherever you have a hazard profile in a community that's had catastrophic um, consequences or severe catastrophic consequences evidenced in the past. And, you know, good science and other factors uh, demonstrate that it'll manifest in the future. At some point, that thing will rise. And the extent to which it rises, the extent to which it impacts is, is, is a little, is quite difficult to forecast in specific terms, not in general terms not in general terms. And this is what I always talk about acceptance. So risk reduction is still, from a mental point of view, moves people towards um, resistance, hope, hoping it won't happen. We've risk reduced, therefore I'll be okay. Not necessarily true. There's a tension there, it's a healthy tension. It's a, it's a healthy tension, but we have to think much more about this. So we absolutely support the Sendai and risk, the risk reduction framework. It's, it's an essential component to, to helping people to become safer. It doesn't necessarily produce safety. Anybody else want to comment on that, John? Schaubler? Sure, 
So the, from a resilience perspective, what we're talking about is, is less to do with the risk reduction than it is to do with the community itself and its capacity to come back. So there's almost an acceptance there that, that, that bad things will happen, as Mark suggests, and you can't eliminate everything. And as Kath alluded to, um, uh, you know, people will do stupid things anyway. Uh, in a flood, they'll get out and on their canoes and think this is great. So, the, you know, there are a few things that were going through my mind then when, when Mark was talking in response. And one is that there's, there's almost a zero acceptance of death in bushfires in Australia. We still haven't overcome that. There was pretty much a zero acceptance of property loss, although that's shifting. I mean, last year in, in across Australia, I think it was something like 600 homes were lost. So there, there's a greater community tolerance to property loss, but, but loss of life in bushfire is still prompts inquiries. You know, you, you only have to lose a couple of lives and all of a sudden there's, a, there's an inquiry. Uh, interestingly, you know, 10 people a year die in Victorian house fires at least. And no one bats an eyelid about that. You know, a couple hundred people die on the road still. So, so you know, disasters don't have the same. But, we, you know, we, I guess as a sector, we're accepting that, that we can't actually eliminate risk. We can actually increase the capacity of communities to bounce back afterwards. And I think, I mean, I'll just add five cents into this. I think in, in the disaster risk reduction framework, where resilience fits is actually a, a reduction in the consequence side of the equation. There's very little that we ordinarily do which is about reduction of consequence. Um, everything we focus on is, is the likelihood side, so the likelihood of the consequence. And I think where resilience fits into that framework very strongly is how do we reduce the consequence. So we reduce it by having more resilient uh, infrastructure, by more resilient communities, by more resilient um, buildings and and uh, social structures. So I think it, the, it still does fit clearly in there. And until we can either get likelihood to zero or we can get consequence to zero, there will always be residual risk. And I think that's the message that Mark is trying to get, is that these things are inevitable. Anybody else on the panel want to comment on that? No? Any further questions? Stuart. Look, thank you very much this afternoon and to RMIT and CRC putting us together. Fantastic. So I really appreciate that. Five great speakers from the humanities to the hard facts and uh, some you know, really poignant examples in between. But we're sort of uh, speaking to the converted. And I, I guess my, my reflection is, wouldn't it be great to have you all at the uh, National Press Club on the National Disaster Resilience Day, or whatever. And in New Zealand a few years ago, National Shakeout Day, you know, every school did the drill. Every, I think, uh, public government building did the drill. It was on the news, in the papers, because they concentrated all the effort on one day. So perhaps, perhaps across government here, and NGOs, and private research, the merits of trying to focus our efforts on one day, rather than having the bushfire, you know, start of the bushfire season and the start of this and commentary on this day, which regrettably probably won't get reported tomorrow. Is there merit in focusing our efforts in one day in Australia? Yeah, Martin. I, um, I agree. I think um, there was some media this morning at quarter past six by Red Cross, I think, on the today program and a little bit of little bit of a smattering across the day, but that was it. So probably a, in hindsight, a day missed in terms of opportunity. But so we'll take that on board, Stuart. I think it's an excellent suggestion. Uh, seriously, I think it is. I think we could make the day a much much bigger day. Now I think now with uh, you know the the 13th of October is a day that's enshrined for international disaster risk reduction. Uh, we we absolutely have to make much more of that. I think in this country, and I'm sure we can do so. Okay. Yeah, I, I also agree. I think that we absolutely should be making much more of today, you know, in schools, in workplaces, just all over the country, everywhere, marked in a way to really think about how we can reduce risks, prepare and respond. Yeah, but I don't think it should take away from everything else we do. So at the beginning of the bushfire season, we, we, so we still do everything else, and this just becomes an additional effort. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah. John? Okay. 
uh, <clears throat> I'd just uh, maybe a different approach. Uh, uh, the, the, a day would be nice, of course, uh, if we. But that day there'd be some scandal breaking, and that'd be no news. I, I, I think it's um, and also it, it risks making our, all our efforts like an event, which, which of course I know the media love and so on, but. I feel we um, we try to do it, most of us here, and of course, as you said, the audience full of converted um, are working out all the time, and uh, and and maybe that's, as I think Kat said, so we don't want that to, to go away. Uh, we'd all like more profile. I, I'm sure the CRC and AFAC together could get us more profile. So, um, but it, it's worth thinking of how we could do it. I think it, the shakeout's probably a, a I would almost say it's a special case for places like California and New Zealand, but, but we could argue about that, yeah. Um, David, I think you've got a challenge for next year. I, <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more, Stuart, in terms of, I think we need to be better integrated in, in what we do. Um, yeah, we, we, we have our own campaign that's different to, to, to others. Um, so there's a lot of effort going in and, and absolutely should be coordinated um, and unified messages. I think the challenge for us is that how do we how do we make disaster risk reduction like putting on your seatbelt like so when you don't do it it's unusual and I think there's a lot more more work that has to be go into it just becomes part of what we, we normally do and, and I think that has to be year round it has to be whether you know in schools um, and it, you know it has to be just the sort of normal stuff that, that, that we do. And we all have to talk the same language and um, and be be unified and use all of our strengths. I think that's that that's one of, one of the things. So, so I, you know, the idea of doing something on a day um, has some appeal uh, because you are focusing some attention. But I think we also need to, you know, exploit sort of opportunities um, that might come up where you can eat. You can integrate a risk reduction message into into something else that, that may be happening. So I think a lot more planning uh, and coordination across all sort of tiers of government and, and with civil society needs to happen uh, to sort of focus on, on on this. Yep, Jim. Uh in terms of, of relatively recent history, uh, 2008, with the election for the first time of Obama, and then, as I understand it, um, a uh, total shakeout of the US Federal Emergency Management uh, uh, Authority, FEMA, who hadn't exactly covered themselves with glory in the wake of um, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, to the best of my, my recollection, the incoming uh, director, whose name I can't remember, uh, sort of uh, created uh, some uh, degree of interest with his uh, sort of with two dramatic propositions. Uh, with the first one, oh, well, they were, his, it was um, uh, in a disaster, the first responder will be your neighbour and count on being on your own for 72 hours. Um, has that kind of sort of you know, strong self-reliant message been considered in the Australian context and rejected, or uh, is it is it uh, would it have wings? Um, it's a really good question, Jim. And I, I noticed in, in New Zealand they have a similar thing. I think Mark, it's the first seventy-two hours. It's not something that's been adopted here. And I, I had cause to think about this over the last few days. Uh, over the weekend, we had a significant wind event here in Victoria. By the end of the day, people were saying, well, we need to establish relief centres because there's 100,000 people without power. Uh, and I'm going, well, whatever happened to a packet of candles and a tin of cold baked beans uh, in terms of community resilience? I mean, so, so the idea that you should be prepared for, for no help for the first few days, it resonates. That was certainly the case in uh, King Lake. Um, where, where no help was forthcoming for a while and the community had to, had to actually fend for itself. So, so yeah, and we don't think about it, we should. Um, there's, an expecta there's a community expectation that bad things will happen and someone will come and help. Uh, I think we need to move away from that. So, uh, it's Craig Fugate is the uh, FEMA Administrator. He's, uh, he's become a kind of a friend and a colleague in the last four years. I meet with him every year. Look, the thing with Craig is that he, um, one, he, he, he has the respect of the president, uh, personal and professional respect of the president. And the reason he does is that 
he calls a spade a spade, and there's there's no there's no grey with Craig. It's pretty black and white, but um, but he has the capacity to really call it the way he sees it, and he has the courage to do that. So he has the confidence to speak and the courage to act on it. And I and I do think our narrative in Australia is a little soft, just quietly, and a little patronising, and we have to develop our narrative has to be much more courageous in this space, as well as compassionate. So we have to link the re, you know our, our more um, a clearer language with a value proposition for the individual. So if we, if we start to move into narratives where we talk about you know, the reduction of suffering of those that you love as part of the narrative and be clearer about what we want people to do, we might start to resonate. I, I wonder, in this country, we just seem to have lost the courage to speak more clearly and perhaps even assertively about what we want people to do. But it has to be, it has to be tempered with humility and compassion and connection. Because in the past, I know um, uh, Bernard Teague said this in the AFAC conference in Melbourne a few years ago that you know we had lost sight of the primacy of life as an industry because we were effectively talking to ourselves. And some of the narrative that came out straight after the 2009 fires, not so much from Victoria but from elsewhere, was quite patronising. Really, you know, we told you so. That's the last thing you want to tell someone when they've just lost a loved one or their, their home. And and we had developed some hubris and some arrogance and some. And, and, and all of that pride and all those things, and we lost connection. So this is why I talk about the ethical premise, that there has to be a reconnection with society through leadership, those of us who are you know, more used to the space than perhaps those that we're here to protect, and make the connection and change the narrative. And, and then I think we'll probably, people will accept a 72 hour power outage without much, many problems. But I worry that we're not as connected as we need to be with our communities. Um, and you know, John's presentation at the very end there, I think, is is a, a really good example of the of the true stories. And we all participate in those stories. We are all a, a participant in that narrative. We we have to make our way back, I think, into into that world and and be a little bit more assertive and confident in in our advice, but through connection, N not not through not, not by being morally superior or having hubris and arrogance. I know that sounds tough, uh, but but if if we're to look in, into our into our leadership styles and our organisations, I think we'd all put our hands up from time to time and say we, perhaps we were a little bit too confident or a little bit too condescending. Hard to hear, but certainly what, I, what I've seen, not, not only in literature, but just by talking to people. And I think Bernard Teague summarised it really well. Uh, and, and, and he would have known more than anyone, he sat through all the testimony of the Victorian fires and, uh, and he absolutely had the right and the courage to say it at the conference. So I think we need to hear that. So clearer messaging, absolutely, but it's got to be done compassionately. Um, I know we've, we've, we've got a short period of time left for questions. Um, what I might do is just run through, pick up the questions, and then throw it to yeah, this one down in the front. So the lady's had her hands up for a while. Um, can we just run through the questions, and then we'll, we'll try and answer them as a collective so that everybody gets to ask their question, and then hopefully we'll get some answers. So go there first. Yes. Sorry, very quickly, um, Martine Wolf. I, um, just a question on your presentation, because you mentioned that um, in order for us to really understand how the consequences will play out or get a better understanding of that, you have to really look at uh, the um, hazard event and the uh, vulnerabilities of that particular community. So I was just wondering if those um, in that modelling that you did, whether those um, numbers of people injured only included that initial earthquake event or whether it also included the after effects of secondary impacts like loss of critical infrastructure and stuff, whether that was also factored into the modelling? You can answer that one quickly. Yes, yes, you can answer that one quickly. Okay. Um, actually, it was, it was quite a basic answer. It was only associated with the collapse of the residential houses. So that's not even to say that there won't be additional casualties from infrastructure or workers' clubs collapsing, just to reference. So it, it really is only those houses and the deaths associated with that. Thanks. My question's to Mark Crosweller and your comment about um, the growing role of the Sendai um, framework for, for governance in Australia. My vague memory is that there's a lot of emphasis on reducing um, the death tolls from, from disasters in the Sendai framework. 
And we saw some interesting statistics today on the reducing death rate that we've already achieved in Australia. Does that give us a different interpretation of Sendai than perhaps some other countries, or does it mean we double down our efforts on the catastrophic events and reduce uh, focus on the death rates here? Okay, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my first one's a comment uh, looking at the 13th of October as a, a day of identification. Maybe in Victoria we could look at stay or, go, stay or go day with regards to the oncoming summer period and the way that people reflect upon their stay or go policy. Um, but I have a comment uh, to, uh, if you could just move you, to Kath. Um, on that stat you showed where the most prominent death was from extreme heat. I just wondered whether drought is part of the whole equation in natural disasters. Thank you. Um, in a context of limited government budgets, where there's lots of other chronic problems going on, what's your um, what's your arguments? I suppose, given that you know the public maybe has high risk tolerance or doesn't really think about this stuff in advance, what are the sort of um, arguments that you put forward ad advocating more spending in that context versus other problems like health or that kind of thing? Uh, okay, so out of those, if we start with cats, question, and then we'll. Go to Mark after that. Okay, the, the heat wave, it does not include drought. It's very much people who are dying sort of during the heat wave or very soon afterwards. But I, I think that, that drought is a huge natural hazard, has many impacts, leads to fatalities in this country with many farmers committing suicide and things like that. So it certainly should be a consideration, but it's not accounted for in our data set at all. Um. So the Sendai risk reduction around deaths, um, look, I think it's a, it, um, clearly we're ahead of the game compared to some countries, which is a good thing, but, uh, but this country, like, like um, most other countries in the world, will face increasing populations pushing into uh, hazard spaces with increasing effects of climate change and intensification and, and increasing frequencies of the events themselves. So, you know, we're doing reasonably well. We could do better, but the thing I worry about is we'll start slipping backwards. So. Uh, in that slide I showed, there's the, there's the getting better proposition and then there's the thinking differently proposition. So, so getting better is, is, is as important as, as thinking differently about the problem. So Sendai is very much in um, getting better, really. How do we make sure we hold those statistics as low as they are and try and get them down even further? So aspirationally, it's always zero, but we know that it's probably not possible. But um, So it, look, it's, it's, it's still relevant to us, I think, probably more, more so to other countries. but. We just can't take our eye off the ball on this. I just think all hazard indicators in cyber, counterterrorism, and natural hazards are going up. Um, so that it needs to be, we need to you know, continue to apply effort and increase effort to maintain our performance, let alone improve it even further. Um, is that working? Yeah. Uh, stay or go day, um, I just go back to my past life as a journalist and there are so many days that, you know, I, I, I wonder about that. I think, I think the sort of fire preparedness programs are, are not too bad. It's interesting that, that even Fire Awareness Week sort of lost some of its momentum in Victoria, which was interesting. So, I, I, you know, I, I'm a bit sceptical of days, frankly, so that would be my response to that one. The competitive budget policy process is another thing. So, you're right. We, we, in government, essentially compete with everything else for funding. Uh, you put up a budget bid for whatever it happens to be, whether, whether it be for, um, you know, mitigation works or, um, you know, specific programs. And it's, it has to, and emergency management budget is largely derived from state budget. The Commonwealth puts in some, but through, mostly through grants, programs and processes and recovery. But, but the actual management of emergency emergencies and the funding of fire services and all that sort of stuff comes out of state budget. So you're up against um, uh, hospitals, schools, transport, and you know, when you, when you, when you stand away from whatever, whatever you're passionate about and trying to write your bid, bids for, 
um, you have to sit there and go, well, are people really going to accept a budget bid for another 1,000 firefighters or would they rather get to work on time with a train service that runs properly? So, you know, that, that's just perennial and, and ongoing. I don't know if you've got... Yeah, John Richards? So, sometimes the investment... I think it's um, um, rate of returns are a really important thing to look at, but sometimes the investment in improvement is actually quite small. And I think Kath made the point we've got to reevaluate where we're putting our effort and work out whether how effective that effort really is. Because I suspect we're spending an enormous amount of money in some areas, which is having very little benefit at all, just quietly. Um, and, and you've seen governments. Um, so, so, you know, would you would you believe the Commonwealth's run out of money? You probably wouldn't. But uh, from a departmental point of view, it's pretty thin. I've got to tell you. Um, but what it does do, it, it is forcing people to think much more comprehensively about the problems we're trying to solve. And I think there's been a realisation that in some, some areas we have put a lot of money into things where it's very hard to see the benefit at all, to be quite honest. But when money, when, you know, money was a bit easier to come by, I think we're probably a bit lazy with it. So, so I don't know that necessarily the investment has to be too much more to have a much bigger effect. Um, but we need, to, we need to look at it in a much more critical sense, I think. John I think that, that was the point I was going to make, is that yeah, being able to look at uh, from a cost-benefit analysis and taking in the, 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 the broader costs. So, so we often count what's lost, whether it's roads, roads bridges, uh, firefighting costs, but you know, also thinking, well, what are the health and well-being and social costs as well, and being able to sort of factor those in. Um, once you can then start, I think if you start to look at um, designing programs that are long term that have a good cost benefit analysis attached to it, then you can start to make some better informed um, judgments. But of course, as John said, you, you're up against it as well. And um, unfortunately, I guess going back to my other comment is that, uh, you know, disaster mitigation is not sexy. It's not a, you know, it's not something that's talked about at the breakfast table. It doesn't play out in, in uh, marginal electorates. So, that I think is the challenge for us: is that how do we how do we turn that into something that people actually do care about? Um, sorry, so just just one well, additional you know. comment. This all takes place in a political context, of course, and and at the moment the one-term government seems to be becoming the norm. Uh, very hard to plan on the basis of your your political masters changing every three or four years. And we're talking about, we're trying to achieve long-term change, so that makes it really hard. Okay, um, I think we're going to have to leave this debate here. All of the speakers will be hanging around afterwards um, for, for drinks. Um, but first, can we just thank all the speakers, please? <laughs> oh, thanks, Richard. I was going to thank everybody too, so that's, that's good. Um, uh, so on behalf of RMIT, I would like to thank the CRC uh, for um, helping us organise it. I guess uh, they did much of the organising, it has to be said. So I'd like to thank uh, David Bruce uh, and Frank Yardley, who were actually doing the behind the scenes work, and, and others, Loriana and others. I'm sure I'm forgetting the names of lots of people. They're also thanked. Um, and uh, we did have, I agree, a fantastic, well, I thought it was a really wonderful variety of perspectives uh, on, on, this, on this topic and um, some great questions from, uh, from you. And thank you very much for, for coming along. We really appreciate it. And uh, to show our appreciation, we invite you to join us for refreshments, um, which should be outside. They should be. So, so we hope. If they're not outside, Richard, will, the CRC will, will uh, sponsor drinks somewhere nearby. So, so please. Yeah.